Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Van's reading chapter 24, uh, The Engine of Capitalism, you know the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The Engine of Capitalism. The planning fallacy is only one of the manifestations of pervasive optimistic bias. Most of us view the world as more benign than it really is. Our own attributes are more favorable than they truly are, and the goals we adopt are more achievable than they are likely to be. We also tend to exaggerate our ability to forecast the future, which fosters optimistic overconfidence. In terms of its consequences for decisions, the optimistic bias may well be the most significant of the cognitive biases because optimistic bias can be both a blessing and a risk. You should be both happy and, very, and wary if you are temperamentally optimistic. Optimists. Optimism is normal, but some fortunate people are more optimistic than the rest of us. If you're generally endowed with an optimistic bias, you hardly need to be told that you are a lucky person. You already feel fortunate. An optimistic attitude is largely inherited and is part of a general disposition for well-being, which may also include a preference for seeing the bright side of everything. If you are allowed one wish for your child, seriously consider wishing him her or her optimism Optimists are normally cheerful and happy and therefore popular. They are resilient in adapting to failures and hardships. Their chances of clinical depression are reduced. Their immune system is stronger. They take better care of their health and they feel healthier than others and are in fact likely to live longer. <clears throat> a, study, uh, a study of people who exaggerate the expected lifespan beyond act Actual predictions show that they work longer hours, are more optimistic about their future income, and are more likely to remarry after a divorce. The classic triumph of hope of experience and are more prone to bid on an individual stocks. Of course, the blessings of optimism are offered only to individuals who are only mildly biased and who are able to accentuate the positive without losing track of reality. Optimistic individuals play a disproportionate role in shaping our lives. The decisions make a difference. They are the investors, the the they are the inventors, the the entrepreneurs, the political and military leaders, not average people. They got to where they are by seeking challenges and taking risks. They are talented and they have been lucky, almost certainly luckier than they acknowledge. They are probably optimistic by temperament. A survey of founders of small businesses concluded that entrepreneurs are more sanguine. I don't. I'm, I hope I'm saying that word right. Are more sang, maybe sanguine, 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 optimistic or positive, especially in apparently bad and difficulty. Sanguine. sanguine. Yeah, I said right. Um, <clears throat> sanguine. Then mid-level managers about life in general. Their experiences of success have confirmed their faith in their judgment and in their ability to control events. Their self-confidence is reinforced by the admiration of others. This reasoning leads to a hypothesis. The people who have the greatest influence on the lives of others are likely to be optimistic and overconfident and to take more risks than they realize. The evidence suggests that an optimistic bias plays a role, sometimes the dominant role, whenever individuals or institutions voluntarily take on significant risks. More often than not, risk takers underestimate the odds they face and do not invest sufficient effort to find out what the odds are. Because they misread the risks, optimistic entrepreneurs often believe they are prudent, even when they are not. Their confidence in their future success sustain a positive move that helps them obtain resources from others, uh, raise the morale of their employees, and enhance their pr prospects of prevailing. When action is needed, optimism, even of the mildly delusional variety, may be a good thing. Entrepreneurial delusions. The chances that a small business will survive for five years in the United States are about 35%. But the individuals who open such businesses do not believe that the statistics apply to them. A survey found that American entrepreneurs tend to believe they are in promising line of business. Their average estimate of the chances of success for any business like yours was 60%, almost double the true value. The bias was more glaring when people assess the odds of their own venture. Fully 81% of the entrepreneurs put their personal odds of success at 7 out of 10 or higher. And 33% said their chance of failing was zero. The direction of the bias is not surprising. If you interviewed someone who recently opened an Italian restaurant, you would not expect her to have underestimated her prospects for success or to have poor view of her ability as a restaurant restauranteur. But you must wonder what she still have invested money and time if she had made a reasonable effort to learn the odds. Or if she did learn the odds. 
60% of new restaurant, restaurant, 60% uh, of new rest, restaurant, oh my God, what is it, restaurants are out of business after three years, paid attention to them. The idea of adopting the outside view probably didn't occur to her. One of the benefits of an optimistic temperament is that it encourages persistence in the face of obstacles. But persistence can be costly. Yeah, that is fucking true. That is fucking true. Persistence can be costly. Absolutely true. Um, an impressive series of studies by Thomas Astebero sheds light on what happens when optimists receive bad news. He drew his daughter from a Canadian organization, the Inventors Assistance Program, which collects a small fee to provide inventors with an objective assessment of the commercial prospects of their idea. The evaluation rely on careful ratings of each invention on 37 criteria, including the need for the product cost of production and estimated, tend, an estimated trend of demand. The analysts summarize their ratings by a letter grade where D and E predict failure, a prediction made for over 70% of the inve inventions they review. The forecast of failure are remarkably accurate. Only five of 411 projects that were given the lowest grade reached commercialization and none was successful. Dis discouraging news led about half of the inventors to quit after receiving a grade that unequivocally predicted failure. However, 47% uh, of them continued development efforts. Uh, hold on, just let me, give me a sec guys. I need to do something close to the door. Close the door. Discouraging news led about half of the inventors to quit after receiving a grade that unequivocally predicted fair. However, 47% of them continued development efforts even after being told that their project was hopeless and on average these persistent or, or obstinate individuals doubled their initial losses before giving up. Significantly persistence after discouraging advice was relatively common among inventors who had high score on personality measure of optimism on which inventors generally scored higher than the general population. Overall, the return on private in invention was small, lower than the return on private equity on high securities. More generally, the financial benefits of self-employment are mediocre. Given the same qualifications, people achieve higher average returns by selling their skills to employers than by selling out on, out on their own. The evidence suggests that optimism is widespread, stubborn, and costly. That is steep, right? That is fucking deep. Okay, well, listen, let's just let's just talk about the facts here. Okay, so he's absolutely correct on the idea that optimism is a bit of a shit one because people who win are lucky. And they say, be optimistic, just keep going, just keep going, you know. And like, you see all this Instagram bullshit that's every day on our fucking pages and everything on YouTube as well. And the question is, how does one become lucky? You know, and there's another point they made is that the fact is that persistence is great, but it can be a terrible curse as well. You know, in life we have uh, gifts and curses, and it'll be a curse if you have to do the same thing constantly all the time and get the same result. Whereas if you have a gift and you create miracles, right? It's a gift. It's only it's a it's a gift when it's a miracle, but it's a curse when it's a tragedy, you know what I mean? And the fact is, a lot of these things I've shown that there are people, you know, how, how, how do you, be, you, my guess is that for you to win is be correctly persistent, meaning that if you find the right direction and do the correct, make the correct choices persistently, then you can be successful. But if you are not capable of understanding that you made a mistake or the fact is you're not trying to learn and see the pattern, that's where it becomes a curse. Where you do the same thing persistently, it will give you a curse in, in becoming successful. And the problem is, as we can see, is that a lot of these businesses are not trying to learn how to be better businesses. And like he says, he, he keeps on, in the book, he keeps on giving great information on how to avoid it, but he doesn't realize it because he's just writing it down. Which is an interesting thing because the fact is the people who are succeeding are the ones that are doing the research. I'm telling you now, the fact that they're doing the research, that the fact that they're trying to make a better product, the fact that they're trying to make a better company is the way that they are correct. Now, the question is, when making a company, 
people are like, what about the money? You need a lot of money to survive. Yes, a lot of these like restaurant businesses, especially restaurant businesses, they fail because they don't have enough investments within them. And usually they take about three years, which is said in the book, three to four years, maybe even five years, just to make start thing, actual profits start running. Because that, that's the type of business we're talking about. That means you're going to be in the shit, in the shit for like five years. You just constantly hustling, 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 hustling. But there's a case where you can actually fix these issues by figuring out, okay, how do we get more customers? What is the perfect period? How much do we spend money on what? Where is the best place? How do, how do I get more results? You have to experiment within these five years to make a better product. And also the, within these five years, you become a, 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 a common business, a, a known business within an area. And I mean, I'm not gonna go all, up, all over the place, but the fact is persistence is great. Uh, restaurant businesses are a little bit fucked up because you need time for people to start to like the, the food and uh, the, the atmosphere. And like, it should be, a, see people are psychologically making these specific places. Oh, I like this place when I eat there. It gives them a comfort and people need to get used to that. Like why do you eat McDonald's? Because it's, we comfortably know that it's going to be the same quality. And that's what restaurants need to do. And the problem is when you go to a restaurant, especially like Italian restaurants, I can tell like the food quality wasn't the same on day one, where the day one was perfect. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then the, uh, the further it goes, the quality just goes fuck out the door. We're talking about maybe different chefs. We're talking about different bosses, managers. A different maybe a, a, re a, re uh, a revamp of the restaurant or some shit keeps on happening and that's why the quality won't be the same and that's why you lose customers because the customers but there is customers develop psychological love between restaurants and I think the best case I can tell you now is that the only way for a restaurant or any kind of business to survive is to do research create loyal customers and don't be afraid to do your research and make sure you, you're persistent in with creating a snowball effect of positive uh, results and, and figure out how to prevent other mistakes and negative, um, negative, you know, what do you call it? Not flashbacks, but negative, uh, let's say negative uh, feedback. There we go, negative, negative feedback. So yeah, anyway, continue to the story. Psychologists have confirmed that most people generally believe that they are superior to most others on most desirable traits. They are willing to bet small amounts of money on these beliefs in the laboratory, in the market, of course, beliefs in one super, super, oh my God, superiority have significant consequences. Leaders of large businesses sometimes make huge bets in inexpensive mergers and acquisitions. Acting on the mistaken belief that they can manage the assets of another company better than its current owners do, the stock market commonly responds by downgrading the value of the acquiring firm because experience has shown that efforts to integrate large firms fail more than they need than they succeed. The misguided acquisition have been explained by a hubris hypothesis. The executives of the acquiring firm are simply less competent than they think they are. The economists, oh my God, this word, Ulrich Malmendier and Jeffrey uh, Tate identified optimistic CEOs by the amount of company stock they owned personally and observed highly optimistic leaders and tools excessive risk. They assumed debt rather than issue equity and were more likely than others to overpay for target companies and undertake value destroying mergers. Remarkably, the stock of the acquiring company suffered substantially more in mergers if the CEO was overly optimistic by the author's measure. The stock market is apparently able to identify overconfident CEOs. The observation exonerates the CEOs from one accusation, even as it convicts them of another. The leaders of enterprises who make unsound bets do not do so because they are betting with other people's money. On the contrary, they take greater risk when they personally have more at stake. The damage caused by overconfident CEOs is com compounded when the business press anoints them as celebrities. Facts! The evidence indicates that prestigious press awards to the CEO are costly to stockholders. The authors write, we find that firms with award-winning CEOs subsequently underperforms in terms of both stock and of operating performance. At the same time, CEO compensation increases, CEO spends more time on activities outside the company, such as writing books and sitting on 
outside boards and they are more likely to engage in earnings management. Facts, 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 facts. Many years ago, my wife and I were on vacation on Vancouver Island looking for a place to stay. We found an attractive but dis des deserted motel on a little traveled road in the middle of a forest. The owners were a charming young couple who needed a little prompting to tell us their story. They had been school teachers in the province of Alberta. They had decided to change their life and use their life savings to buy this motel, which had been built a dozen years earlier. They told us without irony or subconsciousness that they had been able to buy it cheap because six or seven previous owners had failed to make a go of it. Huh, to make go of it. They also told us about plans to seek a loan to make the establishment more attractive by building a restaurant next to it. They felt no need to explain why they expected to succeed where six or seven others had failed. A common thread of boldness and optimism links business people from motel owners to superstar CEOs. <laughs> That's so true. That is so true. The optimistic risk of taking up entrepreneurs surely contributes to the economic dyna uh, dynamism. Dynamism? Dyna I think it's dynamism of capitalistic society, even if most risk takers end up disappointed. However, Marta uh, Kulho of London School of Economics has pointed out the difficult policy issues that arise when founders of small business ask the government to support them in decisions that are most likely to end badly. Should the government provide loans to uh, would-be entrepreneurs who probably would bankrupt themselves in a few years? Many behavioral economists are comfortable with the li libertarian Ooh, libertarian paternalistic procedures that help people increase their savings rate beyond what they would do on their own. The question of whether and how government should support small business does not have equally satisfying answer. Competition neglect. Your facts. This, this guy is a freaking genius. It is tempting to explain entrepreneurial optimism by wishful thinking, but... Emotion is only part of the story. Cognitive biases play an important role, notably system one future. What you see is all there is. We focus on our goal, anchor on our plan, and neglect relevant base rates, exposing ourselves to planning fallacy. We focus on what we want to do and can do, neglecting plans and skills of others. Both in explaining the past and predicting the future, we focus on the causal role of skill and neglect the role of luck. We are therefore prone to an illusion of control. We focus on what we know and neglect what we do not know, which makes us overly confident in our beliefs. <clears throat> the observation that 90% of drivers believe they are better than average is well-established psychological finding that has become part of the cultural and has often comes up a prime example of more general above average effect. However, the interpretation of the finding has changed in recent years from self or oh, agri oh, how do you say self aggrandizement to a cognitive bias consider these two questions are you a good driver are you better than the average as a driver i would say i would i'm better than the average as, as a driver i would say that i would say maybe 80 percent compared to maybe i'm a safe driver <clears throat> the first question is easy and the answer comes quickly most drivers say yes the second question is much more harder and for most respondents almost impossible to answer seriously and correctly because it requires an assessment of the average quality of drivers. At this point in the book, it comes as no surprise that people respond to a difficult question by answering an easier one. They compare themselves to the average without ever thinking about the average. Easy, hard, well, hard question. I like this. Uh, the, do, 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 they compare themselves to the average without ever thinking about the average. The evidence for the cognitive interpretation of the above average effect is that when people are asked about a task, they find above average effect <clears throat> is what is that when people are asked about a task, they find difficult. What the hell did I just say? That? They compare themselves to the average without ever thinking about the average. The evidence for the cognitive interpretation of the above average effect is that when people are asked about a task, they find difficult. For many of us, that could be, are you better than the average in starting conversations with strangers? I would say yes, above 50, maybe 60, 70. They readily rate themselves as below uh, average. The upshot is that people tend to overly optimistic up, uh, about their relative standing on any activity in which they do moderately well. Mm -hmm. So then 50, my bad. I've had several occasions to ask founders and put participants in, in, in innovative startups 
Okay, question, to what extent will the outcome of your effort depend on what you do in your firm? This is evidently an easy question. The answer comes quickly and in my small sample, it has never been less than 80%. Even when they are not sure they will succeed, these bold people think their fate is almost entirely in their own hands. They are surely wrong. The outcome of a startup depends as much on the achievements of its comp competitors and on changes in the market as one of its own efforts. However, what you see is all there is plays its part, and entrepreneurs naturally focus on what they know best, <clears throat> not what they know best. Their plans and actions and the most immediate threats and opportunities, such as availability of funding, they know less about their competitors and therefore had natural find it natural to imagine a future in which the competition plays a little part. That is completely true. People don't ever think about competitors. They do not. They care about what they're doing and that's it. A lot of businessmen do that and I hate that because the best thing you can do is actually copy what other people can do. <clears throat> Colin uh, Kamara and Dan Lovallo who coined the concept of competition. Neglect illustrated with a quote from the from the then chairman of Disney Studios, asked why so many expensive big budget movies are released on the same day such as Memorial and Independence Day. He replied, hubris, hubris. If you only think about your own business, you think I've got a good story department. I've got a good marketing department. We're going to go out and do this. And you don't think that everybody else is thinking the same way in a given weekend in a year, you will have five movies open and there's certainly not enough people to go around. Facts. The canyon answer refers to hubris, but it displays no arrogance, no conceit of superiority. Super, oh God, I hate superiority. Super, super, I can't. Superiority. Super. I think it's super superior superiority to competing studios. <clears throat> the competition is simply not part of the decision in which in a, which in which a difficult question has again been replaced by an easier one. The question that needs an answer is this, considering what others will do, how many people will see our film? The question the studio executives consider that is simpler and refers to knowledge that is most easily available to them. Do we have a good film and a good organization to market it? The familiar, the familiar system one process of what you see is all there is and substitution produced both competition, neglect, and the above average effect. The consequence of competition neglect is excess entry. More competitors enter the market than the market can profitably sustain. So the average outcome is a loss. The outcome is disappointing for the typical entrant in the market, but the effect on the economy as a whole could well be positive. In fact, Giovanni Dorsey and Dan Lovallo call entrepreneurial, firm, uh, entrepreneurial firms that fail, but signal new markets to more qualified competitors, optimistic martyrs. Good for the economy, but bad for the investors or for their investors. <clears throat> Overconfidence. For a number of years, professor at Duke University conducted a survey in which <clears throat> the chief financial officers of large corporations estimated the returns of the standard and poor index over the following year. The Duke scholars collected 11,600. Did I say 11? 11, 11, Your Honor. Are you fucking kidding me, bro? Collected 11,600 such for 11,600 such forecasts and examined their accuracy. The conclusion was straightforward. Financial offers of large corporations had no clue about the short-term future of the stock market. The correlation between their estimates and the true value was slightly less than zero. When they said the market would go down, it was slightly more likely than not that it will go up. These findings are not surprising. The truly bad news is that CFOs did not appear to know that their forecasts were worthless. In addition to their best case about SCP returns, the participants provided two other estimates. A value they were 90% sure would be too high and one they were 90% sure would be too low. The range between the two values is called an 80% confidence in interval. And outcomes that fall outside the interval are labeled surprises. An individual who sets confidence intervals on multiple occasions expects about 20% of the outcomes to be surprises. <clears throat> True. Anyway, so actually I would like to talk about the fact is, uh, he, like, I was just, it, it came up in my mind that the fact is, like, for instance, small businesses, right? How does one small business, you know, become a multi-million dollar business, etc. Well, here's the question. Here's the answer, actually. When you're a small business, you make small money. Fact. When you're a medium-sized business, you make medium money. When you're a large-sized business, you make large amounts of money. The fact is, <clears throat> more money makes more money. You know what I mean? 
the small money makes small money. And that's the problem. The problem is what we keep on seeing, what I keep on seeing in every business is that the fact is that you have to get bigger investors to invest in your company to make large amounts of profit. Now, the question is, <clears throat> can you sustain that type of businesses once it becomes large? The answer is yes, but you need extreme professionals. That's why you need investors to start paying people who are professionally involved with this and who actually have experience and not intuition. So you would need to create a great, you know, professional strategic strategy so that you can make sure that at least there is a, a maybe a high or a fifth, above 50% chance that you could actually make this work. And the more you do that, the more likely you'll make more money. That, that's the issue. You see the problem that that's for me, it makes sense to me that people are like, Oh, I have to start a small bit. No, 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 no. And no, the fact is it for a food market. Yes, absolutely. But the fact is I have an example, Roy Choi, I think, was it Roy Choi? He's a famous chef. <clears throat> he used to do uh, trucks and then he started working up. I mean, I mean, I think he did it before that actually. I'm not sure. There's not a, a basic understanding of what's going on. The fact is that he created a product, a bigger investor found his product. Investor, let's make money out of it. He says, yes, that's how he made more money because someone invited him into making more money. Do you see? That's the whole point is the fact is that no one understands. Everyone's thinking, oh, once I make small business, I'll make more money, more money. No, that's a job. A small business is a job, and that's what's interesting. You need to create a business that sustains itself, that has a team to give, and you need to find an investor who will allow you to access to that money so you can become extremely, extremely fucking rich. <clears throat> the fact is, like even in invest investing scenarios, the only way to make more money is have a lot of money and make and install. You need 10 million to make 1 million or 2 million or you know what I mean? Like that's, that's the case, like for short term gains. But if you want to make long term, you invest 10 million, you could definitely make 100 million within 10, 15 years, depending on where you invest. And that's being overly optimistic. Uh, and depending on if you on your diversification on depending on what type of risk you're taking and stuff like that but the thing is once you have a lot of money it's easier to make more money and once you have a person who invites you within that table you definitely could definitely i'm repeating myself you definitely could you know make more money out of it and create a a snowball effect system <clears throat> in be uh, so let me repeat where you are an in individual who sets confidence intervals on multiple occasions expect about 20 percent of the outcomes to be su surprises as frequently happened in such exercise there were far too many surprises the incidence was 67 percent more than three times higher than expected this showed that cfos were grossly overconfident about the ability to forecast the market overconfidence is another manifestation of what you see is all there is when we estimate a quantity we rely on information that comes to mind and construct a coherent story in which the estimate makes sense Allowing for the information that does not come to mind, it perhaps be because of one never knew it. It's impossible. Yes, okay. I'm. Let me. I should say, I'm not a. Well, I mean, I did get a finance degree, but I'm not a in financial professional, and you know. But I know I do development, etc. But the difference between me and those people is the fact is they fucking the same thing. Speculation is speculation, but with me. It's like, <clears throat> I have a bad, this is a terrible example, but the fact is like, my point of view is always look at the best investors, right? Some of them are lucky and some of them are bad, but here we have the most common best investors, Warren Buffett and George Soros. And the fact is those two people and other, you know, hedge fund, a lot of hedge funders are lucky, but the fact is those two people are completely persistent in what was, what, in what type of investment is going on. And my point of view is this, is that why you should listen to me or why not should whatever. I, I, I have complete overconfidence and yes, that is true. But the fact is I've read all these books and I have an example, like there is an idea how, why should you listen to a maths teacher is the same thing. Why I'm, I, I'm not saying that you should listen to me, but I'm saying 
what like I'm saying that you shouldn't li you should listen to me in a sp perspective of, of taking information all right let's say that not actually taking financial advice I can't tell you what to make but I can give you a, an idea of what's the how diligent you should be on making choice how specific you should be when you make a, a specific choice and a lot of these investors don't give a fuck and they just you know oh this sounds good to me and that's it right but what I'm trying to say is if you ever do make an investment be look at what wh what is the best way of doing something that's the way you should do it that's my point of view that is that, that if people try to like invent new if you want to be persistent find the best person to do it and then uh, find the best person within that you know area of expertise copy what he does be persistent in what he does and then you can do the same thing it's it, that that is my view on things in all areas of life to be the best you got to copy the best and do the same thing it's the same thing with the how does the math how do you learn math right the same thing with like a or how do you learn math well look at the best how does the, that kid over there how did he do it well there's what if there's uh, what, okay we also we avoiding the idea of lack and how he started learning he might have had a a bigger advantage over you because he started studying it. okay but let's ignore the fact that let's say he starts and he figures out a way to be the best ma mathematician in class the fact is mathematicians just do repetition daily constant consistently doing the same thing over and over okay how do i figure this how do i figure this how do i figure this? and they just that's all they do it doesn't have anything to do with you know it's a pure skill and that's my point is that if you could copy what they do you will probably end up at the same place. You know, you follow the same walk, what you go and follow that person, you'll go there. It's, I mean, that's pretty much logical, right? You, like just do what they do. But then there's also timing as well, because what if there's a fire within the pathway? Like when he was there, there was no fire. And then you go there, there's fire. Now that is where luck comes in. But if you follow multiple paths of everybody who does the best thing, then you have more likelihood of getting into the same area. Or, you know, sure, like there will be mistakes, have multiple mistakes, but you still have a likely chance, a more likely chance of something happening positively to you than just following one path pathway in life or, or following a professional or an expert within that vicinity. <clears throat> but my advice to you is make sure you fo follow the best advice in the in the entire world. Like if you could find that information, find it and use it. But yeah, anyway, <clears throat> the authors calculate the confidence interval that would have reduced the incidence of surpri uh, surprises to twenty percent. The results were striking to maintain the rate of surprises at the de desired level. The CFO should have said year after year there is an eighty percent chance that the S and P return next year will be between minus ten percent and thirty percent. The confidence, the confidence interval that fully reflects the CFO's knowledge, more precisely their ignorance, is more than four times wider than the interval they actually stated. Social psychology comes into the picture here because the answer that a truthful CFO would offer is plainly ridiculous. A CFO who informs his colleagues that there is a good chance that the S&P returns will be between minus 10 and 30% can expect to be laughed out of the room. The wide confidence interval is a confession of ignorance which is not socially acceptable for someone who is paid to be knowledgeable in financial matters. Even if they knew how little they know, the executives would be penalized for admitting it. President Truman famously asked for a one-armed economist who would take clear stand. He was sick and tired of economists who kept saying, on the other hand, <clears throat> organizations that take the word of overconfident experts can expect costly consequences. The study of CFO showed that those who were most confident and optimistic about the S&P index were also overconfident and optimistic about the prospects of their own firm, which went on to take more risk than the others. A Nassim as Nassim Taleb has argued, inadequate appreciation of the uncertainty of the environment and never ability due to economic agents to take risks they should avoid. However, the optimism is highly valued socially and in the market people and firms reward the providers of dangerously misleading information more than they reward truth tellers. Bingo, FTX, hello! Uh, one of the lessons of the financial crisis that led to the Great Recession is that there are periods in which competition among experts and among organizations create powerful forces that favor collective, bl collective blindness to risk and uncertainty. <clears throat> Hello. Another thing, 2008 housing market. Hello. 
The social and economic pressures that favor overconfidence are not restricted to financial forecasting. Other professionals must deal with the fact that, <clears throat> that an expert worthy of the name is expected to display high confidence. Philip Tetlock observed that the most overconfident experts were the most likely to be invited to strut their stuff in new shows. Overconfidence also appears to be endemic in medicine. A study of patients who died in the ICU compared autopsy results with a diagnosis that physicians had provided while the patient was still alive. Physicians also reported their confidence. Uh, the result clinicians who were completely certain of the diagnosis anti-mortem were wrong 40% of the time. Uh, here again, uh, so I'm going to say anti-mortem was wrong 40% of the time. Here again, expert overconfidence is encouraged by their clients. Generally, it is considered a weakness and a sign of vulnerability for clinicians to appear unsure. Confidence is valued over uncertainty, and there is prevailing censor against disclosing uncertainty to patients. Experts who acknowledge the full extent of the ignorance may expect to be replaced by more confident competitors who are better able to gain the trust of clients and unbiased appreciation of uncertainty in cornerstone of rationality. But it's not what people and organizations want. Extreme uncertainty is paralyzing under dangerous circumstances and the admission that one is merely guessing is especially unacceptable when the stakes are high. Acting on pretended knowledge is often the preferred solution. When they come to give the emotional, cognitive and social factors that support exaggerated optimism are a heady brew which sometimes lead people to take risks that they would avoid if they knew the odds. There is no evidence that risk takers in the economic domain have an unusual appetite for gambles on high stakes. They are merely less aware of risk than more timid people are. Dan Lovallo and I coined the phrase bold forecasts and timid decisions to describe the background of risk taking. Facts. The effects of high optimism on decision making are at best a mixed blessing, but the contribution of optimism to good implementation is certainly positive. The main benefit of optimism is resilience in the face of setbacks, according to Martin Seligman. The founder of positive psychology and optimistic explanation style contributes to resilience by defending one's self-image. In essence, the optimistic style involves taking a credit for successes but little blame for failures. This style can be taught at least to some extent and Seligman has documented the effects of training on various occupations that are characterized by a high rate of failure, such as cold call sales on insurance, a common pursuit in pre-internet days when one just had, had a door slammed. <clears throat> in one's face by an angry homemaker. The thought that she was an awful woman is clearly superior to, I am in the inept, I am an inept salesperson. I've always believed that the scientific research is another domain where a form of optimism is essential to success. I have yet to meet successful scientists who lacks the ability to exaggerate the importance of what he or she is doing. And I believe that someone who lacks a delusional sense of significance will wilt in the face of repeated experiences of multiple small failures and raise success is the fate of most researchers <laughs> that's actually kind of funny the pre-mortem a partial remedy can overconfident optimism be overcome by training i am not optimistic there have been numerous attempts to train people to state confidence in intervals that reflect the imprecision of their judgments with only a few reports of modest success and often side examples that geologists at will at Royal Dutch Shell became less overconfident in their assessments of possible drilling sites after training with multiple pass cases, for which the outcome was known. <clears throat> in other situations, overconfidence was mitigated but not eliminated. When judges were encouraged to consider competing hypotheses, however, overconfidence is a direct consequence of futures of system, one that can be tamed but not vanquished. The main obstacle is that subjective confidence is determined by the coherence of the story one has constructed not by the quality and amount of information that it supports. Interesting. The main obstacle uh, is that subjective confidence is determined by the coherence of the story one has constructed, not by the quality and the amount of information that supports it. So that is the key of actually creating a, I would say, so by the, they should basically you make choices by the quality and amount of information that supports your claim. And I think that is the correct way of approaching any solution. That is pretty simple. And it's possible to get the solution you want and then improvise and improve on that solution constantly uh, every time you need to improve on that, you know, whatever action or task that you need to perform. <clears throat> Organizations may be 
better able to tame optimism and individuals than individuals are. The best idea for doing so was contributed by Gary Klein by an adversarial collaborator who generally defends intuitive decision making against claims of bias and is typically hostile to algorithms. He labels his proposal the pre-mortem. The procedure is simple. When the organ when the organization has almost come to an important decision but has not formally committed itself, client purpose, uh, proposes gathering for a brief session a group of individuals who are knowledgeable about the decision. The premise of this session is a short speech. Imagine that we're a year into the future. We implemented the plan as it now exists. The outcome was a disaster. Please take five to ten minutes to write a brief story of that disaster. Gary Klein's idea of pre-mortem usually evokes immediate enthusiasm. After I described it casually at a session in Davis, someone be Hi, me muttered. It was worth coming to Davos just for this. I later noted that the speaker was the CEO of a major international corporation. The pre-mortem has two main advantages. It overcomes the groupthink that affects many teams once a decision appears to have been made, and it unleashes the imagination of knowledgeable individuals in much needed direction. As a team converges on the decision, and especially when the leader tips her hand, public doubts about the wisdom of the plan move are gradually suppressed and eventually come to be treated as evidence of flawed loyalty to the team and its leaders. The suppression of doubt contributes to overconfidence in a group where only supporters of the decision have a voice. <clears throat> the main virtue of the pre-mortem is that it legitimizes doubts. Furthermore, it encourages even supporters of the decision to search for possible threats that they had not considered earlier. The pre-mortem is not a panicia. I think it's a panicia, a panencia and does not provide complete protection against nasty surprises, but it goes some way toward reducing the damage of plans that are subject to biases or what you see is all there is, and uncritical optimism. Speaking of optimism, they have an illusion of control. They seriously underestimate the obstacle. They seem to suffer from an acute case of competitor neglect. This case of overconfidence, they seem to believe they know more than they actually do know. We should conduct a pre-mortem pre session. Someone may, someone may come up with a threat we have neglected. Okay, <clears throat> so that's an interesting way of looking at things. They're talking about pros and cons. Duh, of course. So the idea is that how make an organization extremely objective with extreme, like rule, sorry, so let me just repeat that. They need to make a, uh, a pros and cons, and they need to create an objective where, they need to be objective about how they, create rules on how to uh, prevent uh, prevent surprises from, you know, not, how do you say, it? prevent surprises from creating a negative effect on the business. And <clears throat> that's an interesting concept because therefore you're trying to avoid every intuition and every uh, subjective view on the problem because they, get, they have, they're overconfident, they're over, you know, they're over, uh, estimate situations and so the best way to do it is become super objective create pros and cons in the situation within the world's environment that is unpredictable you know find the you know but constantly create pros and cons and decide whether what should the solution for that con should be that is an excellent way of thinking about things anyway that's uh, the last that is not the last chapter i wish it was the last chapter but it's not but i'm having fun that was chapter whatever. I think it was chapter 24, right? Yeah, chapter 24. <clears throat> That's great. That's it. Anyway, uh, great chapter. Really good chapter. Uh, fun to read. Uh, that's it. Yeah, you can leave your comments and your, uh, you know, thoughts in the and ideas in the comment section and like and subscribe and don't worry i won't leave the video at a shitty ending just kidding i'll leave it at a shitty ending sucks to be here bro watch you in the next video <laughs>